Okay, we're recording now, and I'm going to broadcast in three, two, one. Aloha, welcome to Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum's webinar. Our museum is located on Ford Island in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Our site is the location of the first aviation battlefield of World War II. Our mission is to share the stories, impact, and response to the attack on Pearl Harbor that happened on December 7, 1941, and to the battles that followed in the Pacific region. Our webinar started in April as a response to the stay at home and shelter in place orders due to the global pandemic. We've recently reopened the museum, but we continue to host webinars so we can share our uh, stories with a wider audience than those that are physically present in Hawaii. We hope to continue to educate and inspire future generations about aviation through history. We kindly ask for donations, which can be made through our website. So if you enjoy our program today, please consider donating and look at our website, pearlharboraviationmuseum.org for more information. Thank you. So today we're fortunate to have uh, three special guest speakers to learn about how relics arrive at a museum and more specifically, how a piece of the USS Arizona arrived at ours. First, we have Rod Vengston, the Director of Exhibits, Restoration and Curatorial Services at Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. And he's gonna tell us about the USS Arizona bulkhead as an exhibit here at the museum. Welcome, Rod. Hello. Next, we have Daniel Martinez, the Chief Historian at the USS Arizona Memorial. He's going to give us a deep dive into the history of the ship's damage that occurred during the attack on Pearl Harbor. Welcome, Daniel. Hi, aloha from Hawaii. And we also have James Newman, the History and Outreach Manager of Navy Region Hawaii. He's going to give us some insight to the Arizona Relic Program. Welcome, James. And we also have some educators here from the museum and they help behind the scenes to make all these programs possible. So Ford, we have Ford and Ashley. They help monitor the chat and the Q&A to answer any questions that you have as we go along. And they also send questions to me to give to the featured speaker later in the uh, question and answer session at the end of the program. So please add your questions for our honored guest speakers to the chat or the Q&A, and we'll make sure that they get to the speakers at the end of the program. Also, we, have, we usually get visitors from all around the world, so um, we, we would really enjoy if you put in the chat where you are watching this program from. So please and, um, consider entering your home state or your country. As always, please remember to be thoughtful and kind in the chat. Um, with any of the comments that you have to make for this program. So today, today's program, we're going to start with our own director of exhibits, Rod Bengston. All right. Well, thank you, Monica. Aloha from the historic Fort Island, located in the center of Pearl Harbor and the historic grounds of Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. Today's webinar is focused on an iconic battleship and the events of December 7th, 1941. These rendered that battleship and its entombed crew, one of the two ships here remaining as rem memorials, the symbol of the indignation and outrage that prompted the United States of America to declare war on the empire of Japan, thus entering the United States into an already raging Second World War. The battleship we will be discussing became the iconic image accompanying the American rallying cry, Remember Pearl Harbor. The battleship peacefully birthed at its very center of the home of the U.S. Pacific Fleet came to represent the treachery of generally unknown enemy for the American people and its military services. That battleship at rest as a memorial today is a constant reminder of the suddenness of its catastrophic destruction, the agony and loss of its crew, the momentous drama and the acts of heroism that occurred during that and after the attack. Today, that battleship represents the horrors of war, the price of freedom, and most importantly, the hope for peace and goodwill between states and all peoples. That battleship is the USS Arizona. I'm very pleased and honored to be joined by my good friends, Daniel Martinez and Jim Newman, as we discuss the USS Arizona in light 
of the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, uh, our latest acquisition. A significant section of the ship from the amidships area that was removed and stored decades ago to, uh, to accommodate the somber memorial structure that honors the site today. On behalf of the museum, I thank the US Navy, the US Navy Seabees, and Jim Newman, history and outreach manager and commander uh, uh, and the Commander Navy uh, Region Hawaii Public Affairs Office for making this acquisition possible. I would also like to acknowledge our museum's executive director, Alyssa Lines. She became aware of the possibility of acquiring this relic or a relic several years ago and has pressed tirelessly for its acquisition ever since. In the late fall of 1941, the military hierarchy of the Empire of Japan calculated in their minds that a decisive preemptive strike on the strategic home port of the US Pacific Fleet would demoralize and uh, decapitate the United States, uh, ultimately dissuading the United States from further meddling in the conquests that they were actively uh, engaged in in China in the Southwest Pacific. Their gamble was, by the time the United States recovered, the Empire of Japan would invincibly strengthen their oil and raw material supply lines and create several fleets of invincible naval power to protect their new territories and those supply routes. In miscalculating the character of Americans, underestimating the nation's industrial potential and failing to quickly obtain decisive control of the Pacific before their material reserves were secured, the Empire of Japan lost at their gamble. After a stealthy approach to the Hawaiian Islands across a perilous winter seas, six aircraft carriers accompanied by a fleet of support ships launched aircraft toward the island of Oahu in the early dawn of December 7th, 1941. With the assistance of spies and reconnaissance aircraft, they knew that only about half of the U.S. Pacific Fleet was in harbor. They knew that the special targets, the U.S. aircraft carriers, just happened to not be in port. So their primary target was the tight grouping of the largest ships in the port, the U.S. battleships along the shore of the Ford Island in the center of the harbor. All other types of ships, airfields and bases at several other locations across the island were crucial, but secondary to this main purpose of the attack. The plan was to torpedo, bomb, and strafe the targets, return to their carriers, and continue uh, in waves of attack until the job was done. The carrier commanders were also acutely aware that any unexpected arrival of the US carriers in the area while the aircraft were on their mission would be extremely bad luck for the Japanese attack. So the Japanese carriers reserved a cover force to continue and to counter any possible um, attack from the island that was, re was launched in response. The attack was executed using three standard Japanese naval aircraft. The Kate, a three-man crew, alternately loaded with either a single torpedo or a single high-altitude armor-piercing bomb. The Kate flew in two separate types of missions during the attack. One group of the low-flying uh, Kates, approximately 40 in total, unleashed torpedoes at target ships on both sides of Fort Island. And the other group of Kates each dropped a single high altitude bomb from about 10,000 feet on battleship row. The VAL, a two man crew, uh, with a two man crew, designed as a steep dive aircraft capable of delivering one to three lighter bombs against ground targets, 
targeting targets about the radius of a single aircraft or a group of ground troops or igniting a ground structure on fire. And finally, the Zero, a one-man, very fast fighter assigned to protect the slow-moving cates and the low-flying valves from enemy defensive aircraft that may get off the ground or happen to be in the sky. The plan was, if their approach was undetected, the slower cates and their torpedoes would be deployed first. The resulting explosions from their attack would alarm the enemy, so the valves would be quick, uh, quickly follow, decapitating as many aircraft as possible on the airfields and destroying as much infrastructure as possible, including hangars, barracks, and base buildings. During the attack, the Zeros were to perform Combat Air Patrol, or CAP, above the attack and swoop down to take out any enemy aircraft that might get airborne, and then finally have enough ammunition to escort the cates and the valves back to their carrier rendezvous positions. In other words, they were protecting them. So looking at the zero, <clears throat> and due to uh, a mix up of signals from a Japanese commander who was in a Kate, this plan was disrupted at the outset of the attack and all of the attacking aircraft converged on Pearl Harbor at the same time. Even the Zeros came down from their protective cap assignments and joined the attack at ground level, strafing ships, aircraft, hangars, and random targets, risking the complete expenditure of their ammunition and leaving uh, them little to defend the bombers on their return flight to their carriers. The unintentional signal for the three types of aircraft to break from their coordinated and paced effort and immediately attack resulted in betraying their presence to the US soldiers and sailors below much sooner than they planned. Japanese aircraft were also flying into each other in their flight plan, uh, creating aborted attack runs and lumbering recoveries imperfect uh, for uh, releasing their weapons and perfect for hastily manned guns on the ships and air fields that were defending from below. Around five minutes into the attack <clears throat> on Pearl Harbor area, Kate's armed with a single high altitude armor piercing bomb, each at an altitude of almost 10,000 feet, flew in from the direction of the mouth of the harbor. They had approached Oahu from the northeast with the rest of the attacking aircraft, but flew around the side of Oahu to enable them to assemble their line of bombers high above the mouth of the harbor on the south side. And they approached Fort Island and Battleship Row flying from south to north. They were arrayed in a long string of successive flights of five aircraft each, flying in a V formation, the fifth lead aircraft commanded each group. When that aircraft released its bomb, all the others then released. The effect was that of a scatter shot, and so it increased the probability of its hits along battleship row and the multiple targets. The USS Arizona moored among the pairs of battleships on the Fort Island side of the USS Vestal, which was actually an attack repair ship. It was on its outboard side, on its port side. This mooring protected it from the slightly earlier torpedo attack from Cates, flying in low across from the repair docks and harbor width. The Japanese planners had included the high altitude level bombers to target the line of battleships moored behind this outside line and other flanking battleships and repair ships or, or, or oilers. They had also constructed a very special bomb for this task to attack those battleships. Lacking a supply of high grade steel and having little weapons grade alloys, they cannibalized the artillery shells of one of their own battleships, the Nagato. 
and converted them into high velocity armor piercing aerial bombs. It is one of these hybrid devices that pierced several protective decks of the USS Arizona, pierced the forward um, oil bunkers and detonated its modest 50 pound charge and caused a rapid, almost instantaneous chain of explosions uh, of the US Arizona and all of its forward black powder magazines. The tremendous explosion of the forward sections of the Arizona momentarily drew the attention of the attackers and defenders alike across the harbor area. As a great cloud of flaming black smoke billowed up out of the ship, the attackers continued their onslaught and the defenders, awestruck but now steeled and determined, fiercely fired at their soaring enemy. Other ships sank, capsized, and attempted exit from the harbor while the aircraft heroically struggled to get airborne and fight back at the, in an air-to-air -air combat. The USS Utah succumbed and rolled over a victim of an earlier, uh, some of the earliest moments of the attack, of a torpedo attack, her crew entombed to this day at the site of her mooring. The attack continued with a second wave of Japanese aircraft, but the US Arizona was already mortally wounded and drowning in flames. In the aftermath, most of the ships sunk that day were raised, repaired, and joined the surviving U.S. carriers in their relentless drive of almost 33 years toward Okinawa and directly threatening the home islands of Japan. The USS Arizona, however, was severely torn apart, broken, and lying mostly submerged the decision to allow her and her crew to rest was soberly made. War with the Empire of Japan was quickly declared by Congress and the war effort ensued with a passion and determination. The remaining superstructure and heavy guns were removed. Standing alone above the surface, a blasted and twisted section of the midships became the only sign of the great ship's presence in the harbor. A deck and a flagpole were affixed, creating a visible location to mark that hallowed site. At 8 a.m. every morning, the traditional time of colors, the stars and stripes have been saluted there, as well as a salute to all those lost aboard the Arizona in the country ever since. Thank you, Rod. I, uh, that was a wonderful story about the USS Arizona. And now what we're gonna have is uh, we'll have Daniel Martinez, the chief historian at the Pearl Harbor National Memorial, um, share some videos of the model of the Arizona from the National Memorial itself. Sorry about that sound. We're gonna make sure that that sound's turned up so you can hear it. Let's restart that. Hi, I'm Daniel Martinez, Chief Historian here at Pearl Harbor National Memorial. The exhibit behind me is a model of the USS Arizona. And for people's interest in the ship, which is, my gosh, it's probably one of the most recognized names in World War II history and one of the most famous ships. This is the USS Arizona as she appeared on the morning of December 7th, 1941. She was a formidable ship. She had four gun turrets on her, and in each turret were three 14-inch rifles. Could throw a shell, like the one right over there, nearly 20 miles. Some say it weighed about as much as a Volkswagen Beetle. The deck of the ship was armored. 
because she was intended to fight other battleships. Over 13 inches of armor were on, under her deck to protect her from projectiles coming in. But on the morning of December 7th, she was not prepared for what was coming that day, which were aerial bombs dropped from nearly 10,000 feet above Battleship Row, plunging here in between where you see my finger in the shadow, plunging through that deck and down perhaps three to four decks into the forward magazines, igniting over a million pounds of explosives. The Arizona literally lifted out of the water nearly 50 feet. But the ship itself was a city gone to sea. The crew that was aboard Arizona had a specific job. Every one of these elements of the ship, whether defending it, powering it, moving it into battle, navigating it, steering it, all took place in these spaces here or below decks. Gun turret number one is located here. Gun turret number two, three, and then four. And you'll note we have a seaplane in the air right here because these seaplanes could be launched off of gun turret number three and from the stern. And their job, to go out and observe the enemy up there, and in some cases, watch the fall of shot and radio back to the ship. Next, we're going to zoom into the uh, USS Arizona and uh, take a look at that. Stand by. People have asked, where did the piece of wreckage that is now at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, where was it taken from? What part of the ship was it located in? Well, we can show you right now. As the light comes on, you're looking directly at the section of the Arizona that was removed as part of the boat deck, making way for the building of the USS Arizona Memorial. This part of the wreckage and a great portion of the boat deck ended up at Waipio Peninsula. And as the light comes back on directly to it, you can now see the detail and compare it with the wreckage that is now on display. Now we're gonna call Daniel to tell us a little bit more about that. So welcome, Daniel. Welcome and aloha to all from the National Park Service. This uh, piece of wreckage that the Navy had set aside over at Waipio Peninsula first came to my notice about 1985, and I had the opportunity to go out there and see that wreckage. We had constant uh, uh, inquiries over the years as to the superstructure of the Arizona being placed there. They asked if that bridge was there. And so the conflict of what the superstructure was led to us responding to it. When the United States Navy was ordered uh, by the Secretary of the Navy to uh, dispense pieces of wreckage to veterans, Pearl Harbor survivors, and to museums, the Navy and the National Park Service worked together because many of the inquiries were coming to us and we related them to our Navy partner. Keeping in mind for many of you uh, that don't know, the National Park Service and the United States Navy have been partners since 1980 when the visitor center was established. In that agreement, it was decided that the Navy would operate the boats and take the visitors to the memorial. The National Park Service would host them at the visitor center, provide a theater presentation, and then upon watching the movie, step out and go to the boats and include that as part of the what we call the USS Arizona Memorial Tour. And so this cooperative agreement between the United States and the Navy has continued since 1980 and still flourishes to this day. You'll soon be talking to my counterpart and uh, we've worked together for many, many things, including the interments of Arizona crewmen that wish to be returned to their shipmates. And it takes place on a very solemn occasion. And again, a partnership between the United States Navy and the National Park Service. It has been my pleasure to be the historian of this site since 1989. And uh, in doing so, uh, I had the pleasure uh, and the honor to interview uh, 
over 350 oral histories of Pearl Harbor survivors. When we say Pearl Harbor survivors, it includes both the airmen that were at the airfields, which were the first hit during the attack, and all of those sailors that were at the uh, stations at Pearl Harbor, at Kaneohe Naval Air Station, uh, also at Ford Island, uh, where the Pearl Harbor Naval Air Station was, Eva Field, all of these uh, people at Schofield Barracks and at Fort Shafter were of interest to us and including the civilians, many of which we interviewed actually were, you know, what we know today as Department of Defense workers, but they were Navy federal workers, of which my grandfather was one who witnessed the attack very close to Mary Point Landing. So as you can see, the interest in the story continues to grow. And, uh, and you can see now a partnership between ourselves and the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum and the United States Navy has benefited what you are seeing on this program. It's been my pleasure to be called upon to assist the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum in their display. And I think when you see it in the next few moments, uh, you'll be as happy as I am at what is a magnificent a work has been done to display this piece of the Arizona, this relic, so the visitors there can see even more of this story. Thank you so much, Daniel. Next, we're going to have the, next we will have James Newman, the History and Outreach Manager for Navy Region Hawaii, tell us about the RELIC program. So welcome, James. Thank you, and thank you for everybody for tuning in. Thanks also to Rod and Daniel uh, for all the great work that you guys do. And as Daniel said, the partnership that we have is very, very important and very, very special to us, so, so thank you. Um, just to give you a little background, I know Daniel already touched on this a little bit, but the final removal of the material where the memorial is currently built was removed by 1961 and then placed at Waipio Peninsula. It's interesting that that area in Waipio Peninsula was actually a salvage area during World War II, so it made sense to move it to that area where typically you would have a salvage material. For security and safety reasons, as I'm sure you understand, the area is restricted to the public. So the Department of the Navy, um, recognizing the historical value of the wreckage from the superstructure, did place those removed pieces under the jurisdiction of what is now called the Naval History and Heritage Command. They turned around and gave designated commander Navy Region Hawaii as their agent in the distribution of the relics, as Daniel discussed. So that, that was uh, worked out closely with the Park Service, with USS Arizona Union Association, with the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association, following specific US codes, um, Title 10 specifically, actually, and the National Historic Preservation Act. So out of respect for the USS Arizona as a national memorial and the organizations closely associated with it, these are the organizations that we consider for relic. Bonafide veterans groups, which could be VFWs, it could be reunion associations, educational organizations like colleges, uh, elementary or high schools, historical uh, organizations, could be foundations, could be museums, community centers. And when we say community centers, we're talking about maybe a town hall or a capital building or something like that. The bottom line is that these relics are to be used for display where members of the public may see it. Um, and in a manner consistent with preserving the historical significance of the USS Arizona, the, the legacy and so forth. So they're not to be distributed for individual use. It's really to get the USS Arizona, the wreckage of the USS Arizona, for people who can't come to Hawaii to see it um, at the memorial. It's a way to get that wreckage out to the rest of the country where they can enjoy it, where they can uh, learn from it, where they can, uh, where they can facilitate education and discussion and so forth. So nonprofit use only, not intended for sale or fundraising. And then the last thing I'll say, and I'll touch on this again at the end is, it's, it's, shipped, as an as, it's shipped as is, there's no cost to the Navy. So any organization that would like a, a piece, we just have to work it out, the shipping, the logistics related charges. And that's something that's usually worked out with the CVs. It's typically not a whole lot, but it is kind of on a case by case basis. And to date, nearly 150 relics uh, have been sent to these types of organizations. As I, my last count was 26 states. I may have missed a state or two, the District of Columbia. Um, there's actually one that went to Normandy, France uh, for the, the uh, commemoration um, for the D Day invasion. And then also, uh, very proud of one that's gone to the Imperial War Museum in London. So, the Imperial War Museum felt that they are, the Pacific War was not uh, 
represented as well as they would like it to. So they're actually going to use a piece of the USS Arizona to be to be a centerpiece of their uh, World War II, the World War II in the Pacific uh, exhibit. So at this time, I'm going to show you some slides. Just to, I know everybody's curious what this looks like when we talk about the relics. What are we talking about? And let me back up just a little bit. This is actually, this is what the relics looked like in, in 2008. Backing up, this was Adam Radford's memorial. So when Daniel talked about the memorial being built and the wreckage being removed, that section that you see right there that's highlighted, that is the, that's a big part of the section that we're talking about. And that was a memorial that was established by Admiral Radford back in 1950. While the current memorial was being debated and discussed and designed, he did put a platform over that wreckage so that they could have maybe a dozen people or so on that platform and they could carry on ceremonies all the way up until almost when the current memorial was built. So this is what it looked like in 2008. That's around the time I got here. Um, again, this is out at Waipio Peninsula. It was in a very remote area, but this is what it looked like about 10 years later. Um, you can see a fence has been built around it, um, and that again is thanks to the CBs. You can see that the area has been cleared out. Um, at this point, I really do want to highlight the work of the U.S. Naval CBs, uh, Naval uh, uh, Construction Battalions. They have done a wonderful job of taking ownership in a lot of ways of these relics, keeping that area clean. Um, when they remove pieces, you can see the wood that's there. So they'll make sure that they'll set up uh, an area. If they have to remove a piece, they will secure the rest of the wreckage so that nothing else happens to it as they move forward in removing these pieces. This is another picture, um, again, highlighting the CBs. You can see the fence there. They got a vehicle that they're using to, to kind of clear out the area. And then I wanted to point out, might seem like a small thing, but I love it. They've got the flagpole that they put up at the fence. So whenever they're working out there, they'll have the US flag flying and then they'll also have the CB flag flying because this is their area and they have taken a great deal of responsibility for making sure uh, that, that this is done right. Just another picture assessing the wreckage, just a little bit of a close up of what it looks like. A lot of that has changed in the last few months because they are beginning to move a lot of that out and move it into kind of staging it in different areas. And then here's a picture of CBs working on the relics. And what I want you to notice is safety first, of course, for the CB themselves. Um, they, would, they will do a, an assessment around the area to make sure that whatever work they're doing isn't going to cause any hazards to any of the surrounding environmental area. And then also for the wreckage itself. They're very, very careful when they're cutting the wreckage to make sure, as you saw that wood in that previous picture, that everything is stabilized. And then they'll take the, the, uh, the, the wreckage, they'll take the relic, they'll move it to their compound on Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. At that point, they'll get it crated up, they'll stamp USS Arizona on there, and they'll also stamp the CB logo on there. And then from there, it will either be, they'll either transport it to a shipping company, or a shipping company will actually come to Joint Base and will take it off and get it to the person who's requested it. Uh, to date, as I said, nearly 150 relics. This is obviously not an extensive list. I just put these on here uh, just to show you the various places where these relics have gone throughout the country. As I already mentioned, to my count, 26 states, uh, District of Columbia, Normandy, France, and also the Imperial War Museum in uh, England. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of some other uh, places where it's gone. This is probably by far the largest one to date. This this is actually the Pima Salt River Tribe in Mesa, Arizona. They built what they called the USS Arizona Memorial Gardens, and they actually built that whole area that you see there specifically for the relic. They have an outline of the USS Arizona, and then in the center, they have a facility, climate-controlled facility, that they built for the relic itself, and there's a little bit of a close-up there. Um, so it went from Waipio Peninsula to this facility in Mesa, Arizona, and this they, the tribe is very, very they take great pride in our country. They take great pride in the contribution of their tribal members who fought uh, for our country in, in the various wars. So the Arizona is kind of the centerpiece, but the, all, the entire Memorial Gardens really represents all of the contribution of that tribe uh, to the defense of our country. Okay, this is another one that went to Rhode Island. This was actually on behalf of the World War II Foundation. And the reason I picked this picture, a couple things. You can see a relic that's typical of the kind of a medium size that we might send out. You can see, again, the crate that has USS Arizona. 
It's got the CB logo, but then you've got a veteran there who's receiving it. A lot of times when these relics are sent out, there'll be veterans that actually receive it. And that's an important point because the veterans um, in these various areas take great pride um, and they may not be able to get out to Hawaii, the community members that might not be able to get out to Hawaii, but this is a way to bring the Arizona to the community and do uh, similar to what the, the memorial itself does. Uh, it becomes a touchstone for, for World War II and the contribution of our service members in World War II. This one is not um, the biggest one in any stretch. Um, you can kind of see where the, where the circle is. That's roughly what the, where the relic is. But I love this one because this was about 10 years ago. This was a Boy Scout in Atchison, Kansas, single Boy Scout who wanted to do a project. And he heard about the relics program and he got this relic and he arranged to have that whole area made into a, uh, a monument basically for the relic itself. The, 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 uh, the platform and the USS Arizona in bronze and then the, the relic itself encased in that, um, that glass encasement. Very, very impressive. And to me, it's really the spirit of the USS Arizona relic program when you got a Boy Scout who's able to arrange to have this done. So I'm very, very proud of that one. Uh, last thing, what's the future? We're trying to be more proactive with the program. We've been largely reactive where people have contacted us and I have dozens of requests at any given time. But we try and, we're trying to look around in the country and see where should these relics go? Um, not just where are they reacting, to, where are they responding to us, but where do we think they should go? And this is a mall at the University of Arizona and I put in yellow there. It's actually a full scale outline in brick uh, of the USS Arizona. And we've reached out to the University of Arizona and said, hey, we've got this relics program. We'd really love to see them go to your mall there at the University of Arizona. So we're, we're in discussions with them right now to do that. And we're trying to, to find more places where, where we can have that. So just to wrap it up, uh, if you want to have a relic, then please, you can see my email address right there. I would ask that you put USS Arizona relics request in the subject line in case I get inundated. <laughs> um, those will go to a, a particular folder. And if you are going to request a relic, please, if it's a bona fide, as I said, organization, like I mentioned before, um, if it is a veterans group organization, an educational organization, historical organization, or community organization, then feel free to, to send me an email with USS Arizona relics request in the subject line. And then I can get back to you with the process that's involved because there is a process. And essentially what it is, you just need to tell us what you wanna do, why you want the relic, and then a very brief description of how you intend to display it. As I mentioned, there'll be no cost to the Navy. So we would work out those details with the CBs. Um, be patient. Uh, the relics are in a very remote area. So it's not that easy to get to. It's not very quick to get to them. We don't have a staff that's working on this all the time, so um, we get dozens of requests at any time. So I anticipate a program like this webinar. I may get a lot of requests. We will answer the request, but we just ask that you be patient. I can't give you a specific ETA. And the CBs, who, as I already said, they play a huge role in this program. They love the job that they do, but they can only do it as operations permit. So we are we are welcome. To, I'm welcome to receive any request to that email address. Make sure you put USS Arizona relics request in the subject line, and then I will respond to you um, as we're able. And again, we, we really do want to get as many of these out to the rest of the country as we can. Great, thank you, Jane, so much. Um, we're gonna welcome back Rod Bankston, our curator, and he's gonna explain to us how we have situated our bulkhead piece into our museum so that it makes sense in our narrative. So Rod, if you come back on and I will share my screen and we can look at it together. Okay, thank you, Ashley. The Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum is very pleased to display our new exhibit titled, A Piercing Blow, The Aerial Attack on the USS Arizona. We're very proud and deeply honored to display this surviving relic of the USS Arizona, a remarkable artifact of American World War II history. The relic, as it was delivered to us, is approximately seven and a half by 14 and a half foot section of two riveted steel plates, steel vertical posts at intervals, separating missing porthole frame windows, 
and all weathered as a single unit. It is dramatically illustrating the concussive force and heat of the explosion that took place further forward within the, and on that ship. Our first task was to photograph and document the relic to allow us to design a display to support it. And that is what this image is. It's one of the very first images we have uh, upon receiving it. Given the relic's size and considerable weight, a steel frame uh, framework was conceived wide enough to support a solid base for additional vertical supports and strong enough to support the overall weight. The challenge of mobility added to the demands of the design and that was solved by the addition of a series of pneumatic wheels attached under the steel framework beneath the deck facade. The deck facade was conceived as a form reminiscent of the plate steel of the 1940s battleships, as well as a floating mooring point. The deck color was researched and based on the colors adopted for battleships pre-World War II, and the selection of color was greatly informed by the recent National Park Service research. Principal designer and fabricator for the display mount, Deanne Kennedy, was assisted by Randy Gratz, Mikey Tobin, Mike Kang, and the entire Sheely Restoration Shop volunteer team, including George, Mark, Vinnie, and Jimmy, and Paul, and others, and really the entire Hangar Owls Restoration team in the historic Hangar 79. Deanne Kennedy, a well-known theater designer, theater set designer here on the islands, did a fantastic job with the assistant of Mike, assistance of Mikey Tobin in creating an exhibit in its, in, form, in its final form based on the very difficult requirements set forth from this original concept of display. Principal welding was done by CPI Concrete Specialist Group with invaluable advice from our restoration shop volunteer welder, Vinny. The research and editing of the reader rails were overseen by the curatorial, our curatorial assistant, Alexis Stallings, and several other museum staff members, including Eric Padal, Ashley Durant-Smith, who is on, with us today, and all contributing to the research and editing team for all of our um, ERCSI projects, exhibits, restoration, and curatorial services. The relic is positioned in our Aviator Adversaries Gallery inside the museum's historic Hangar 37. The relic is purposely in line with our authentic Kate bomber, portrayed as a bomber poised for arm, uh, poised to be armed on the deck of the Japanese flagship Akagi. The lead aircraft carrier of the six carriers sent from Japan to attack the U.S. installations across Oahu. This relic is also positioned opposite the Japanese Zero, portrayed as the fighter aircraft poised on a deck of one of the carriers in the combat air patrol mission to protect the bombers during their operation over Oahu. The relic displayed consists of a vertical plane of the relic itself, steel post um, extending from the all steel frame below and constructed with um, and covered with the blue panels of the support pedestal. Viewing the relic from the side allows us to imagine being inside the gallery, uh, the, excuse me, the galley compartments at midships and then gazing out the portholes at the attack ship um, USS Vestal, Vestal moored beside the Arizona that morning. Beyond the Vestal, you may have caught a glimpse of the harbor in the far shore that day. We currently have F-22s flying over. This is an active military base, so I'm going to talk over them. Uh, viewing the relic from the side, from this side, allows us to imagine being on board the USS Vestal and looking toward the great battleship moored beside you and just beyond it in the shore, uh, on the shore, are the trees of the Ford Island. So from the side that's shown at the moment, we're looking out at the Vestal, the Vestal, which was the attack repair ship. 
the next uh, image shows looking at the side of the ship uh, in through the portholes uh, toward the inside of the ship. The force of the explosion uh, forward of this compartment is readily apparent in the warped appearance of the heavy steel plates. Heat damage is also visible. The long dark band stretching from right to left horizontally is oil residue from the oil bunkers that were erupted as the um, uh, ship settled uh, in the harbor after the attack. The fuel tanks of the Arizona have been steadily leaking drop by drop for nearly 80 years. The slight incline of that band of residue records the unlevel resting position of that great ship. Again, I thank Monica and Ashley and Ford for hosting us today and my very good friends, Daniel Martinez and Jim Newman for joining us for this discussion of the USS Arizona and the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum's edition of this moving tribute to the ship, its crew, and all those who gave the ultimate sacrifice in defense of our country that morning. We are honored to display this relic and will preserve and protect it for the edification and inspiration of all future generations. All right, thank you so much, Rod. I'm gonna turn it over to Monica and we're gonna get started with our next section. Yes, all right. So thank you so much to our featured guest speakers. We are now going to have our Q&A session. We have uh, had so many questions come in during this program. So um, hopefully you are ready to answer some of these questions. All right, let's get started with the first one is for Daniel. All right, so Daniel, the, we have a question about a skull that was found in Pearl Harbor. Do you know if it was ever identified? Uh, we were asked to look into that issue. Um, it was supposedly found near the area of 1010 dock. Um, there was a probability that one of the aircraft that was shot down, one of the torpedo planes, that it could be from them. Um, there was three occupants in that plane, as Rod pointed out, and uh, it had been hit right on on the engine cowling and disintegrated. Mike Winger, who is a colleague and one of our uh, consulting historians, he and I worked on that issue. We turned it over to DPAA at the time. And um, we uh, unfortunately did not hear back from them for over a year. And when we did, it was a simple answer that it did not uh, uh, compare. Um, was I satisfied with that answer? Absolutely not. Um, have we moved it forward? No. Since then, there has been a reorganization at that uh, site. And uh, I have some contacts now that maybe I'll uh, revisit it. But uh, we put a lot of work in it. We did some comparisons of, of, the, uh, of the skull to actual aviators that were in that plane. And to, to our... Um, pretty non-scientific but more historical approach, we were satisfied that it may be one of the aviators. But that is unsubstantiated at this time. But um, uh, maybe perhaps I should visit the idea of publishing the report on our website and uh, look at that. But uh, yes, that, that, that there was uh, investigation into it and that now rests with uh, DPAA. Thank you, Daniel. I have another question for you, uh, similar. It's related to the attack on Pearl Harbor, and this one is from Robert. Robert's mm -hmm. asking, uh, weeks after the attack, tapping noises were heard from the hull of the Arizona. Since the ship had unexploded ordnance, I understand not responding to those taps then. However, in 2020, with the technology that we have today, do you think that, that we would have reached the same decision? Well, there, there's a little bit of confusion about that. The Arizona, um, was one of the ships um, that we have, um, and unless they, this person has an eyewitness, we didn't have any really tapping come from that ship. However, we did have tapping coming from the battleship West Virginia and tapping from the battleship Oklahoma. 
These were two vessels that were sunk that day. Uh, Dick Fisk, who was a Marine bugler aboard the West Virginia, uh, was part of the Marine guards on the vessel after the attack. And he said it was so disturbing uh, to hear that and know that they couldn't get to them, uh, that they placed cotton in their ears so they didn't have to listen to it. Um, there's also a urban myth about a group of three sailors uh, that were found in a compartment with a calendar that marked off the days. And uh, they, they couldn't have done that because they, they would have had a loss of oxygen in that compartment. It was decided that one of the Pearl Harbor survivors uh, said, oh, we marked off calendars to how many days we were either getting out or getting leave. And so that may have been the answer to that. But the, the horrific thought of being trapped in a ship and slowly losing your life because the loss of air is, uh, is hard to even comprehend. A wonderful book uh, on the USS Oklahoma tells the story of how th those individuals got out from the ship. And I think it's called Escape from the Oklahoma. But if you just Google Oklahoma and Escape, this book was written and consulted by Oklahoma survivors that got off the ship by swimming out. They had to swim down to get out. Well, the talk about Oklahoma, I have a question from John that uh, related to Oklahoma, but this one is for James. It says, are there any other relics on YPO that are related to the USS Oklahoma or the West Lock disaster? Um, no, not that we're not, not that we're aware of. There is, uh, now there was a, a section of the Oklahoma mast that was on Fort Island for many, many years. And there was also a small ladder that was inside that mast. And I want to say maybe 10 years ago, um, the Oklahoma Air National Guard was out here and they actually transported that mast, that section of the mast to the Oklahoma State Capitol. And then that ladder, which was in my custody for another couple of years, um, that ended up going to the Naval History and Heritage Command in Washington, D.C. So beyond the wreckage that's at YPO relating to the USS Arizona, uh, we are not aware of any other wreckage from any other ship. Thank you for that, James. Um, you were talking about the mast of the ship, so I have a question about the Arizona superstructure, and that one is from Gerald, and I think this one is related to yours also, James. It said, what happened to the large pieces of the Arizona superstructure? Were they scrapped during the war? Um, a, a lot of it was scrapped. I think a lot of, a lot of like a lot of the other ships, um, after the attack, a lot of material was also sent and reused or repurposed in other ships, uh, barrels of guns and so forth. Uh, I know some of the barrels, and Daniel may have more to say about this, but as I understand it, many of the barrels from the Arizona were intended to be used in coastal batteries here on Oahu, uh, Battery Pennsylvania and Battery Arizona. Um, but if it wasn't reusable material, then it was more than likely scrap. Daniel, did you wanna add any on to that or? I can ask you. James did a good job about the Battery Arizona and Battery Pennsylvania. I visited both. Uh, Battery Arizona was not finished. Battery Pennsylvania was finished in 1945 and actually test fired those guns. And so they literally took sides of the ship, all, all the shell lifting and powder lifting mechanisms from turrets number three and four. And, uh, and I, I would also say that um, I have a photograph in our collection of all the wreckage coming off of the Arizona and other ships being piled up to be loaded aboard ships so they could be, that metal could be reused in the war. I have a question from Jim. This one also for you, Daniel. It says, uh, why was the bent over superstructure not used as the memorial? Well, uh, uh, Jim uh, alluded to that, um, that we have pictures of them literally lifting that off big sections, and it was taken over to the scrapyard. The idea of memorialization was really not realized as much during the war, although they held the first December 7th remembrance. Uh, we have a photograph of that. The Navy held a remembrance uh, shoreside, and then eventually Admiral Radford, with, with the wreckage removed and the boat deck still there, uh, uh, it was referred to earlier, but they built uh, in 1950, the first memorial platform. 
So Admiral Bradford, is, his, his plaque is still on the USS Arizona Memorial, but he placed that on December 7th, 1950. And I'm right now writing up a piece about that. I've got some new research on it. But um, yes, the idea of, of honoring the ship, and we're not sure when this happened, uh, when ships came into Pearl Harbor during the war, if they passed the Arizona, they turned to and saluted the ship and ringed uh, sailors along the side. And so that kind of unofficial but official uh, honoring the Arizona took place uh, starting during the war. And there, and I just to add to what Daniel said, that actually the the it's actually a requirement that any ship passing the Arizona, it is a requirement that they render honors to the Arizona. That's actually an instruction. Cool. A question from Kelsey is, how long was the Arizona in Pearl Harbor before the attack took place? Uh, is that for me or Jim? Um, I think that um, it could be either for you, Daniel, and I know Rodney that you're also, uh, you know, you have been studying the Pearl Harbor attack for, you know, in depth for many years. So um, also offer that question to you. Okay, well, um, the, the ship itself came in on December 5th and tied up for her last morning, she tied up at 10 o'clock that morning. And uh, Tom Freeman rendered a incredible piece of art of that last morning. And if you go online, you can see it. So December 5th, you're meaning only two days before? That's correct. The, the fleet came in, uh, all the fleet came in. And it, it, there's a whole story about wh why certain ships ended there. It had to do with, uh, with what time they came in, what time the fleet came in. But a battleship row was assembled that morning uh, on December 5th, Friday. All right, I have a few questions about the uh, submarine, the Japanese fleet submarines. Robert is asking, did a fleet, Japanese fleet submarine get into the harbor as has been rumored for decades? So uh, who answers that one? Rod, do you, would you like that one? Well, there's well, been considerable. Well, go ahead, Rod. Well, uh, just a little bit, and I would very much appreciate you two um, adding to it or correcting me that there's considerable um, uh, research been done on that and some some theories that actual whole books have been written about. Um, it's true that the mouth of the harbor had uh, a whole array of Japanese submarines waiting in uh, wait for the uh, battleships to um, that might or any ships that might try to escape during the attack to, um, to engage them. Uh, however, the, I think what's being asked is, did one of the mini uh, midget submarines get in? And to best of my knowledge, uh, even though people have seen what they think is a periscope in some, in some uh, photographs, it's a, it, it appears to only be like the top of a, a little a wave or something. Uh, there's no evidence of that. But the mini subs uh, were did attempt uh, to um, engage the, the entrance to the harbor, and in fact, a sub was uh, destroyed around seven o'clock. I think it was Daniel. Was that right? Um, yeah. The and, um, the midget sub uh, uh, event was engaged five I-class submarines that laid off of almost. Uh, within earshot of Waikiki, they could hear the music coming from the Royal Hawaiian. That's, so there's a book, um, Burl Burlingame did a, a wonderful book on, on the midget submarines and submarine action. And uh, one thing to keep in mind, five midget subs were launched. They carried two men. They were powered by electric uh, batteries and they had about 14 hours of that and uh, one of those actually did enter the harbor and engaged on the um, west side of Ford Island and uh, right straight across from the Air Museum. And uh, the USS Monaghan had a torpedo fired at it and nearly hit it. And the Monaghan closed and fired upon it and rammed it. And the, cr the, cr the crew was so elated by their action um, they had increased their speed to like, about 16 knots and they ran out of harbor and they ran aground at Waipio Peninsula. Luckily, the, that part of the peninsula was sandy and the cheering stopped and then they backed off and uh, able to pull away and went out of the harbor cheering again. 
as if, as one of them said on the sh uh, the ship, uh, and in his oral history, it was like a baseball game. They were cheering, so that that submarine was later recovered, and you can see it today at Etajima Naval Academy, where it's displayed. And that's a mini sub, a mini sub. Yes. Yep. So, but no fleet subs tried to make their way in. No, the fleet subs could never get in. They were too, too big. Yeah. But, you know, uh, the fleet sub action, one of the great failures of the Japanese attack, uh, people say, well, they didn't hit the oil tanks and all that. That, that wasn't the target. And they were never going to hit oil tanks because as, as from the aviation point of view, you do not want that target clouded by black oily smoke. Their job was to the Pacific Fleet. Should they have hit it on their way out? obviously, but they didn't. And so they had accomplished what there was their mission. But the submarines, uh, which was over 40 submarines were in the area. They were really largely ineffective. They did not fight as a wolf pack like the Germans did, but the, here they were in the area. The carrier enterprise is gonna be in the following day, December 8th, she comes in. She should have been attacked, but uh, for the unknown reason of why the Japanese strategy with the submarines failed, it's really discussed in, in, in Advanced Force, Burl Burlingame's book. I, I really strongly advise people read that because it gives you the whole picture of the, of the Japanese uh, submarine mission uh, uh, during the battle that took place uh, on Oahu. And you know, uh, you and I know, and, and Jim knows that we, we, although we say Pearl Harbor, it's just an acronym for the attack on Oahu. The entire island was under attack for two hours, 350 aircraft over this island. And when you think about that, you can imagine how my family, who were civilians, seeing all these planes and all these explosions and the, and the fires coming up from Pearl Harbor was as astonishing to them as September uh, 11th was to the people of New York. Daniel, um, was it in Burl's book, the story about the crews returning to uh, Japan and being brought up on charges of cowardice because they didn't engage? Did, was that I story? It, that's, that's part of the story, but what we don't know is how far that went. Um, you, that's the one issue uh, what is, is, is that they saw the zeal of the, of the Japanese aviators mm -hmm. and this failed mission of they, they only sank one ship and she was a ship that carried wood. I can't think of the name of her right now, but it was, it was a failure. And, and, and so uh, I remember going with Burl and some other folks and, and seeing 1941, which is Spielberg's film. And it has one of the sequences of the Japanese submarine yeah. firing on Hollywood. Um, it, it was as comedic as that, and, and, and for us, the United States at that time, uh, if they had pressed that attack, that could have conceivably even be more devastating than what happened at Pearl Harbor. Had they knocked off the Lexington and the, uh, and the Enterprise, our two key carriers, what, have, that, what would the history of the Pacific have been like? Yeah. I should also mention that we've mentioned uh, Burl Birmingham, but uh, he was our f uh, former historian uh, and passed away uh, recently. And uh, and that's and that's who we're uh, referencing. So yeah, thank you for remembering him. I was wondering if if, if our naval historian has anything he could add. <laughs> no, you've covered it all. I think. Well, we have a lot more questions, so let me ask a few for you. Uh, we have one, just to close up the submarine question, um, this is a pretty simple one. Have all the uh, mini submarines from Japan been accounted for? Um, in my view, only four have been accounted for. Uh, <clears throat> I was very, very, as this is just my personal opinion, but my professional opinion, I, I do not think that the mini sub was found in Westlock, and I just, it just doesn't fit, and, and it never did, and it's, it was unsettling that they came to that because many people believe it was found. I think we're still missing one of the submarines. And until we have, in my view, viable proof, that one is still missing. Mm, thank you, Daniel. Uh, question for you, James. Uh, have any of the relics been asked for or sent to any of the facilities in Japan? Um, no, there aren't any relics in Japan. Um, we haven't had any requests for relics in Japan, but we have looked at that possibility. So as I said before, 
we're trying to be more proactive with the program instead of just react responding to requests. We're trying to look around and see where um, they should go. So Japan is one of those places that, you know, it probably makes sense to have something, but it's just a matter of where would we, where, where would be the best place to do that? So we are looking into that possibility. All right, thank you, James. The next one here's uh, for Rod and then possibly Daniel, but let's let Rod go with it first. He said, Janice is saying, we are thrilled that the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum has this special addition to the museum, uh, but why is it not at the Pearl Harbor or the Arizona Memorial? The, the Arizona Memorial has um, a, um, a similar piece um, in its museum, um, but for us to tell the story as an aviation museum, uh, we felt it was extremely um, uh, powerful to have it in juxtaposition uh, with the Kate, uh, an actual Kate that was the type of uh, plane that uh, dropped the aerial, the, the, uh, the bomb that had the massive explosion. Arizona had been hit several times, but that massive explosion. Um, and uh, you want to add to that? Uh, Daniel? Yeah, I, th I, th I think that, uh, you know, we, we uh, Scott Pulowski, who is our curator for the museum, uh, went out and selected the piece uh, that was going to be placed in our new museum, which, which opened in 2010. And so we have a, a piece from the same area of what is called the potato locker. It's part of the galley and uh, vegetable locker and all that. But our piece um, uh, shows uh, a side piece of that area. Uh, with the large oil stain running across it because over the years that oil caked on the side. And you can see it on, on the uh, piece that, uh, that the uh, Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum has. It, it's a much larger than our piece, but our piece is, is centrally located in the museum and it went in there in 2010. So um, it, it's, a, it's a really good um, uh, example that the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum has and it works very, very well with their interpretive design. Yes, I know I've seen it myself and I think uh, Rod, you selected the images to show in our presentation today, but you, not the viewpoint. You have to come to the museum to get the viewpoint of the aircraft through the holes. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a really amazing view. And I was going to say there's, there's plenty of relics, so uh, we, we want to get it out to as many museums as we can. So this question is for Rod. On that point, James, this one is for Rod. Uh, Rob is asking, are you going to, is the um, Aviation Museum going to be getting other relics from the USS Arizona? And if so, how would you use those additional relics? Uh, we are currently um, have a plan to add two more pieces to the exhibit. Uh, this was our initial request uh, to uh, Jim and to uh, the Navy um, and to the CBs to see if it was possible. They are smaller than the piece that, uh, or the, the um, section that we're looking at now, but they go to um, ex uh, showing the extreme force and um, uh, heat that was involved. And so it's a, a, a large beam that's sort of twisted, but again, not the scale of this uh, current piece. And then a smaller piece that I would like to include uh, in a uh, freestanding display uh, unit near uh, the other, the, the one you've just seen. And in it, we will showcase um, individuals that were um, survivors and other stories uh, related to the USS Arizona that day um, as special exhibits that rotate through um, our exhibit calendar and um, so that's how that will be utilized but they will be in a cluster together. Mm. All right thank you Rod. I had a question that has to do with the survivors that I wanted to ask and I think this one might be for Daniel. It's uh, Rob is asking do you have to be an Arizona survivor to be interned on the Arizona or can you be any Pearl Harbor survivor? Um, I'm going to uh, partially answer this and then let uh, Jim take it. Uh, we do this in partnership with the United States Navy. Uh, the criteria was established by Jim Taylor years ago, who had that position of the, the liaison on our interments. And the qualification is that you must have been aboard the ship uh, on December 7th and be a crew member. 
Now, who set that up? It was in consultation years ago with the Navy, with the, the Air, USS Arizona Survivors Group. And so they're the ones that set the guidelines. We simply observed the guidelines as the Navy had established them through the Arizona Survivors uh, years ago when we began uh, putting uh, people back uh, in, in their ashes into the ship. And, and as Daniel already, I mean, he, he pretty much laid it out, but I mean, you, you need to be, have been a crew member of the Arizona to actually be interred in the Arizona. We have had instances where spouses um, have been, their ashes have been scattered in the vicinity of the Arizona, um, but to actually be interred in the ship, you would need to be an Arizona crew member. All right, thank you, James. I have a question from Libby. And Libby was asking, um, when my friend was a child in the 40s and 50s, she remembered being on the Arizona. So she was wondering if people, civilians, were allowed on the ship at one time. Uh, yes. Um, it, um, it was by special invitation. Uh, the Navy hosted them. Um, uh, Admiral Radford's uh, platform was, um, was featured uh, in a, uh, a program, and I'm trying to think of the program right off the top of my head. This is your life, Ralph Edwards. And so um, you can actually watch that. And it was one of the Arizona crewmen, uh, Samuel Fuqua, who was the uh, senior surviving officer of the Arizona, recipient of the uh, Medal of Honor. And you can actually see that, and it's wonderful. And so it was the first videotape program in television history. And they are filming from a Navy boat as uh, Admiral Fuqua is there rendering honors that morning, not December 7th morning, but just on that morning. And, uh, and Ralph Edwards goes aboard and as the, uh, as the uh, Admiral turns, he says, uh, Admiral, good morning, or something along that lines. And, and he turns to him and says, what's this all about? And he says, sir, it's about you. Mm. And so the program uh, takes him from the Arizona, where you can see the Arizona, as Admiral Radford had established it, the, the memorial platform. And they go to Block Arena. Now think about Block Arena, because it comes into the vernacular of history later. And they host the show there. This will be the place where Elvis Presley will give the benefit concert that helps with the building of the memorial. So Block Arena is also where the Battle of Music was held the night of December 6, 1941. So there is kind of this trifecta of history. Thank you, Daniel. I have a question here and um, I'm not sure, I think it's gonna be a refer, refer, referred to you, Daniel. Um, will the Arizona um, Memorial Park or museum or the park service be acquiring the USS Hoga? Uh, we tried years ago to uh, get a f friends group to acquire the Hoga. The Hoga is not right now in Arkansas on display and there is no, uh, no movement at all uh, anymore to acquire the Hoga. We had wished to have her. She was, uh, she was uh, you know, awarded a uh, service. Uh, acclamation by Admiral Nimitz for her heroic work all along Battleship Row, but no, there is nothing that is in the works to do that at all from the National Park Service. Thank you, Daniel. Question for James. This one's from Emily. Will the pieces that uh, you mentioned that are in the YPO Peninsula, will they ever be moved indoors for more protected storage? Isn't keeping the pieces detrimental at YPO Point detrimental to the preservation of the Arizona pieces? So when I first got here and I went out there, we looked into trying to move that and where would we move it to and, and how would we move it and so forth. And at the time it was determined that uh, trying to move it might actually be detrimental to the wreckage itself. We built the, we built the fence around it. And then what we did is that's how we got the CBs involved to get the CBs to help, help us with this, to start to begin to separate the wreckage and stage it and so forth. Um, so that we can start moving it out of that, that location. It was, it, it was determined at the time, and again, this was maybe 10 years ago, um, that it would be better for us to leave it there and begin to stage it out and just try to move it uh, as large sections as we can. 
Um, the other thing is, I know the Park Service archaeologist was out there, chief archaeologist was out there a couple years ago. He did mention, and I'm not talking about the totality of the wreckage, but he did mention that there was some value to having some of the wreckage there just because it allows, uh, you, can, you can compare and gauge what's happening with the wreckage on land to what's happening with the wreckage in the water. So there is some scientific value to having it there, but we're not saying that it all should stay there. So that's, that's where I get back to where this, what the CBs are doing. All right, trying to, we're, we're trying to move it, and some of it is going, there are sections that the CBs have that are in their warehouse, for instance, not all of it, but we do have some of it that has been moved indoors. Uh, but by and large, we're just trying to work with what we have out there and, and get it moved from out there to indoor facilities, like I showed you the Pima example, and, and other places, even if it's in a small display case, that's how we're moving it indoors. All right, thank you, James. I do have a couple more relic questions for you. It's uh, from, Jam from James. He's uh, saying, was the massive armored conning tower forward of the navigating bridge scrapped, or is the removed portion um, somewhere on Oahu? The only portions of the Arizona that, that we are aware of uh, are what obviously are under the memorial, and then the section that Daniel described uh, in his presentation at Waipio Peninsula. We're not aware of any other wreckage in, in Oahu. All right, and then uh, I have a question from Dale. Let me find this question. Dale's asking, are there any relic programs for other battleships that were present on the uh, attack of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, specifically the USS Maryland? Yeah, as I mentioned before, we're not, we're not aware of any other wreckage. The, the only wreckage was the Arizona, and then we did have those pieces from the USS Oklahoma. But there's no, you know, the Arizona relics in YPO is a pretty big section. That's why we're able to, to donate out sections and call it the relics but we're not aware of any other uh, parts of the battleships that could be in a program like this. Mm. All right, um, I had a question. There's a couple more about the wreckage. And so um, I know that you've answered uh, a lot of these questions. So um, some of these might be a repeat, but I think that they have slightly different uh, questions that they're asking. And Dean is asking about 14 years ago, he said he recalled a section of the wreckage um, brought ashore on the Southern end of Fort Island. Is it true that that was a piece of the mass of the Oklahoma and are there other um, pieces of wreckage from the attack that are still being found? If so, are they stored, also stored at YPU? Yeah, again, so that piece that he's talking about is more, is pro probably the Oklahoma mast um, that I already mentioned. And that mast was picked up by the Oklahoma Air National Guard and transported to the Oklahoma State Capitol where it's on display at the Oklahoma State Capitol. And then there is a, a ladder from that that's at the Naval History and Heritage Command. But other than that, um, there is no other wreckage. Right. Uh, I can add some to Jim's narrative if you'd like. Yes, please. Um, when uh, in May of 1991, the Navy was undergoing uh, their usual uh, and large, but it was large scale dredging of Pearl Harbor because Pearl Harbor builds up and it's only 45 feet deep and we have big vessels coming in. And we got a call uh, from uh, the contractor and, uh, and the Navy regarding that they had believed they had picked up what appears to be a torpedo. And it, the contractor, when he was using his shovel picked it up by its warhead. And when he saw what it was, he immediately abandoned the, his, his work and EOD, Navy EOD was called in and the torpedo was retrieved. Where this story goes is back to the Oklahoma wreckage because this is a torpedo that failed and we did the story on that and all that. But when they continued their, their dredging, we were getting pieces of the Oklahoma being brought up and one was an ammunition chest that was massive. It was about 12 by 16. We have it in our collection. And other pieces of the Oklahoma were coming up. The propeller from the one of these uh, uh, planes that was aboard, seaplanes that were aboard the ship, some of the paraphernalia from the interior of the aircraft, which was called a Kingfisher at the time. So we've picked up pieces of, a, of that and uh, the torpedo uh, that you see on display inside our museum is the one that was picked up in 1991. So there are still 
pieces of the Oklahoma down there because when she capsized, all of her superstructure was ground into the harbor. And she, if you look at the photographs, she did not uh, totally turn over. She's at an angle. And so that's what happened. All of that uh, wreckage from the, her mass and everything were there. They did remove the mast from the California and put it at the end of Magazine Island as a control tower. You could see it. So there, there was salvage and there was use of that salvage, but um, it was very, uh, let's say they discriminated which they were going to use, but that not all the wreckage in the area where the Oklahoma was has been removed. It's still down there parts of it. Thank you, Daniel. Um, James, uh, Peter's asking, are there any uh, relics from the Arizona located at the CB base in Fort Wyneme, California? Um, that's actually what, that's a great question because, because of the work that the CBs have done, um, we are working on getting a section that's going to go to the Port Wanimi uh, Museum. They have a wonderful museum there. And yep. so another, that's another great example of how, hey, where should these relics go? Um, and that was at the top of the list was, was something for the CBs at their museum. So that again, very good question. And that is definitely in our plans. And Ken is, Ken is um, asking, uh, have you ever thought to have a traveling exhibit for the relics? Uh, no, haven't thought of that. I know that there have been museums that have taken small pieces uh, out to various, uh, there have been parades and so forth in different places. Civic organizations have taken pieces that have been donated and they've, they've taken it on something of a traveling exhibit in their local area but nothing, uh, there's nothing that has been done on a nationwide basis. So it's, a, it's a very good, very good question, very good point, something that we could look into. Uh, but at this point, beyond that local type example, we don't have any, any kind of traveling exhibit. Thank you, James. Uh, Daniel, next one is for you from Barry. When is it expected that the fuel of the Arizona will stop seeping from the ship? Well, there's not a way to put a clock on that. Um, it's been leaking since December 7th, 1941, roughly about a quart of oil per day. We measure the, there's one point where the oil emanates from that. And I want to say that that's the singular place. There's other places it comes from, but where it comes out of is a, out of a hatchway in the stern. And, uh, and uh, as the ship continues its deterioration, and that's kind of interesting too, because it's, it, it, we, we actually have biogrowth that supports the ship. It actually expels the oxygen. But over a period of time, we've noticed changes in the decks, the main deck that we can look down on. And when we look down on that, that's the area of the galley and we're seeing changes there. You can actually see the oven still. And that's where this wreckage that the, that we have in our museum and what the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum has there. And so the oil is, is a droplet about every 20 to 30 seconds comes up. And then it, when it hits the water, it expands out and, and dissipates. But um, right now that's the National Park Service and the Navy keeps a, a eye on that. And if should we have a oil spill of any magnitude, which we don't anticipate, but we always prepare for, uh, both uh, the Navy and the Park Service, uh, I used to be part of the oil response team. We have a plan in, in, in place so that if anything like that happens, we can catch that and in case it not have it as a major oil spill. The t oil itself is leaking from the bottom tanks, which is literally uh, under the mud. And so uh, this, this passage of time there's an estimate that it, that it takes nearly, uh, you know, uh, anywhere 15 to 20 years from a droplet of oil from that place to get to the top. Mm. So, but that's just an estimate. But think of it as, uh, you know, the ship is a six story building underwater, and that's what's working up. Wow, it's a, it's hard to imagine that scope. Uh, we have, we're almost at an hour and a half now and the questions keep coming. So what I want to do is ask a few questions that seem to have simple answers and, uh, and then uh, we want to get James' contact information again. But uh, someone is asking uh, about the name of Burl's book. Can someone provide the name of Burl's book? It's, it's called Advanced Force. 
Okay. All right. Thank and, you. Um, and uh, uh, if they contact uh, the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, we w I will work with them on how they can obtain a copy through the museum. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, and then a quick one from John. He said the turrets are gone, but are there any hoists or other ancillaries remaining in the Battery, Pennsylvania or the Battery, Arizona sites? Um, I've been to both sites and the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, there are hatch doors with frame numbers. They're still there. The best preserved site is Battery, Arizona because it's very dry, like where the wreckage is. And uh, the, the harder site that's having its, uh, you know, battle with, uh, with exposure is the site at Kaneohe at the, uh, uh, it's at Makapu Point. All right, two more quick ones. Andrew is asking, was Commander Edward Ellsberg, the salvage man, involved in any of the salvage efforts at Pearl Harbor? I'd have to look it up. There yeah. was the charge of salvage. Maybe Jim's got this one. No, I don't. I, I'd, have yeah. to look up. I'd have to look it up. All right. Thank you. So another one is, uh, this is about the USS Utah. So Janice is asking if there's anything being done to try to preserve the Utah and stop the deterioration. Well, the USS Utah, and th then I'll defer this to Jim, is under uh, the American uh, uh, Naval uh, Heritage Command, rather. And um, obviously, we have dove on that vessel. We look at, at, at what's happening with the vessel. Um, the exterior, since I've been here and since coming in 1984, I have seen the deterioration on the exterior of it. Um, we, the National Park Service undertook uh, in 1985 uh, dives and drawings of the ship. So it's in the Submerged Cultural Resource Study, which is available online to look at. And, um, and so, yeah, we work with our Navy counterparts because when, many times when Scott uh, Pulowski took the divers in, we had Navy uh, support and they were in the water with us. So there's this, this has a, been an ongoing Submerged Cultural Resource and Study, and we have a cultural resource manager in charge that I work for. And uh, any questions addressed to the US, USS Utah can be addressed to us dealing with cultural resource issues. Um, the other is that it is still a Navy ship and it's under the uh, guidance of the United States Navy as well. So we work as partners. Maybe Jim can add to that. I think that we, we have reached the hour and a half point and so I think that we have reached our time and unfortunately I did have a special message for both uh, Daniel and Jim because we don't always know who is in our audience but today we had uh, the son of Daniel Stratton, an Arizona survivor, Randy Stratton, and he wanted me to pass this message on. So I'm going to have to make sure that we pass it on to James. But um, he wanted to say thank you and give you a salute for all of the hard work that you did to get the pieces of the Arizona and provide that honor um, for the USS Arizona um, sailors that died on board that day. So a salute from the son of Donald Stratton, Arizona survivor. That's great. And then um, for the person uh, that asked about James contact info, we'll make sure that we put that on our website. I know that uh, I'm sure that one person asked, but I'm sure that many more will want that. So we'll make sure that that gets on our website. So thank you so much to our experts today that shared their uh, expertise and so we could understand how relics get to the museum and also to learn more about the piece that we have at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. So on behalf of all of us here at the museum, we wanna just thank you for joining us today and learning more about this one specific facet of Pearl Harbor. And we look forward to welcoming more and more of you back to the museum when we are able to have visitor, more visitors and visitors from off island. So mahalo and aloha. Bye now. Bye bye. Aloha.